It is really a great privilege to be here with you all this evening at this extraordinary gathering. Um, I am really excited for this next conversation. Um, our next guest lost um, the historic gubernatorial election in Georgia last month, but she's still fighting. She's backing a federal lawsuit to help fix some of the deep-seated problems in that state's electoral system, including, as evidence would show, voter suppression. Here to share uh, with us how such reforms might actually help the voters of the state of Georgia, but also across the United States, are the former Democratic leader of the Georgia House, Stacey Abrams, with Fortune's Beth Cohen. woman who clearly needs no introduction. Um, backstage, you know, you said to me that you did not lose, you just did not win. Yes. So we're going to talk about that. But, um, you know, you ended your campaign for governor of Georgia three weeks ago. Um, as Cliff said, it was a historic race. If you had won, you would have become the first black female governor of any state ever. So that would have been great. Kind of cool. <laughs> Cool. Would have been kind of cool. Um, so, but tell us what you've been doing these last three weeks to kind of get past that disappointment and frustration. The fetal position hurts. So, uh, uh, so you know, look, I had an unusual election on a number of levels. One, it was extraordinarily successful, and because of thank you. Uh, and and when I say successful, I mean we turned out voters who had never been engaged in the body politic. We tripled the number of Latinos who voted. We tripled the number of Asian Americans. We increased the African American number by 38%. We doubled the youth share of the vote. We did a lot of stuff, and yet. And so my first responsibility was to figure out how and yet did not happen again. And my first responsibility was to channel my rage and my despondency into action, and we launched Fair Fight, uh, which is our organization that is pushing for fair elections in Georgia and across the country. <laughs> Number two, I took a nap. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I mean, I, I'm being both facetious and serious. This is hard. It is hard to have something that is the sole focus of nearly two years of your life. Not only not come to fruition, but to not to come to fruition under a cloud. And there is this, this moment, I, I was joking with Beth backstage when Cliff said you know, she lost. I'm like, no, I just didn't win. Uh, because we don't know what really happened because of the miasma of voter suppression. And there is something about uncertainty that's worse than knowing you just suck. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, very seriously, knowing that you did this thing wrong, that these were the, the issues, that's, there's clarity there. And absent clarity, your mind starts to whirl and it doesn't stop because you're constantly playing things over and over again, trying to figure out what it could have been. And so taking a nap was important. I needed to sleep and rest and let my, my mind sift through what was going on. And the next thing I did was make myself not make decisions about the next thing. Um, I know none of you are familiar with this, but I'm a bit goal-oriented. <laughs> and I, I've known what I wanted to do for most of my life. I, have a, I talk about this in my book. I have a spreadsheet that I've had since I was 18 that takes me out to age 68. Um, Anybody else have that? No, just you? Okay. I, I, for those of you old enough to remember, I did it on Lotus 1, 2, 3. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so there, there, the last thing I had to do was really sit still and not try to plot the next step, not plot my revenge, not, <laughs> not plot my, not to tell people what my next job is, not decide what I'm running for, but to really let myself just not decide. Uh, that lasted about seven days, <laughs> but that's, a, that's a, an eternity for me. But those are the three things, and, and I think it's made it easier for me to push through, to not break into tears or not be you know, righteously indignant 
when I see an injustice, you know, like a, a butterfly getting knocked out of the sky. You know, I'm, I'm good now. I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> but you, so when you ended your campaign, you never actually conceded. Nope. Tell, that was intentional. Tell us why. Because words matter. Um, I mean, the, the joke about not losing, for me, concession, there's a legal and moral nature to conceding. It means you accept that something is right, that it is just, that it is proper. What happened was not just. And it's not, a, it's not about whether I get to be inaugurated as governor. It's about thousands of people who were denied the right to vote in the most remarkable democracy ever put on this earth. That anyone had their vote tarnished or restricted or narrowed is wrong. And I cannot, in the, you know, in the company of those people who stood up and took a chance, it was wrong for me to say that what happened was okay. Because in our politics and in our lives, whether it's in business or the nonprofit space, or just you know, when you break up with someone, we're taught niceties. We're taught to obfuscate what happened to make them feel better, to make ourselves feel better, so we can move on to the next thing. But the problem is when you lied over reality, when you use the wrong words, it sticks with you. And you, you miss the truth of the moment. And so, yes, he is going to become the governor. Yes, for four years, he will be responsible. But no, I do not concede that what happened to me and to others, to Republican Dan Gassaway, to any voter who went unheard, I will not accept that that is true and a good and proper thing. So I want to go back to, to why you decided to run. So if, if you had one, you would have been the first Democratic governor in Georgia in 15 years. Yes. So what did you see in the numbers that no one else saw that made you think you could win? So I've been looking at this, as I said, I think about these things a lot. But I began thinking about running for governor of Georgia in 2010, right before redistricting. Um, so for those of you who don't pay attention to politics, redistricting is the process when we take the census and turn it into gerrymandered maps that deny political powers there. Yeah. <laughs> so, I was on the wrong end of gerrymandering. <laughs> And I did so as the first woman to ever lead a party in the history of the state. So my inaugural major issue was the fact that under my watch, we lost a lot of seats. And we had no ability to push back. But that meant I spent a lot of time with the numbers. I looked at these districts that were being drawn. I looked at the composition of the state. And I then took it upon myself to travel the state. Uh, so before I ran for governor as Democratic leader, I traveled to 150 counties out of 159 in Georgia. I did all 159 during the course of my campaign. And what I saw were there were pockets of communities that were not being acknowledged in the redistricting. That this neighborhood was drawn in a certain way, but I knew that it had a Cambodian community that had been in Georgia for 12 years and that their young people were gonna be coming of age. I knew that this pocket was changing and I can count. And I knew that, <laughs> I'm really good with math. And I could tell that there were communities that were being discounted, not just by Republicans, but by Democrats. We'd gotten used to certain voices being silent. And we, again, use the wrong language. We call them apathetic. It's not apathy, it's despondency. It's, it's lack of hope. And so my mission was to figure out if I could create a campaign that convinced them that they should take a chance, that there was a reason to believe that if they spoke up, they could be heard. And in the process, we added 800,000 Democrats to a midterm election. I received more votes than any Democrat in Georgia history. So you, so you've called, you've called the state blue but confused. Yes. Okay. So. People, people have described you as someone who spent much of her life trying to push through doors that people have wanted to kept closed. And it seems like that also happened in this case. People told you that Georgia was not ready for a black woman governor. How did you get past that? Well, since these are my friends, it was hard. Um, <laughs> Your friends told you this? Oh, yeah. Um, one of the 
most painful parts of the campaign was the first month. Uh, when you launch a campaign, you're told to call your friends and family. That's where you get your start. And this is true if you're, if you're raising money for a startup, if you're starting a nonprofit. Friends and family are usually your initial investors. And I'd started small businesses. I'd run campaigns. I'd started a nonprofit. So I know what that's like. I know how you seal yourself to make the phone call. And they pretend they don't remember who you are. You're like, Mom, it's me. Um, <laughs> And so I was ready, and I, I was, but you go to the easiest people first. And there were three or four women that I'd known my entire adult life who had been with me every campaign, every endeavor, and they told me they weren't going to support me because they didn't think a black woman could win. And the way they would say it is, oh, Stacy, you're the smartest, you're so good, but I don't think a black woman can win. And they would whisper that I was black like I, it, was, it was news. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I've seen me. I know. <laughs> I'm like, and I was black yesterday. And the day before that, everything else I've tried, you've believed it possible. But the sheer act of imagination for them was too much. But what was more disappointing was that they felt comfortable telling me. They felt comfortable saying that it was a disqualifier, that knowing all of the other metrics that they believed I was disqualified for running. And one tried to convince me to stay in the house. They're like, you know, in 10 years, you can do this. And so that was hard. <laughs> then we started the campaign. I had this extraordinary campaign manager. Her name is Lauren Growargo. She is brilliant. If she were a man, she would be on the cover of somebody's magazine, which she was the architect of. And our campaign has never been done before. We raised more money than any campaign in Georgia history. We had 50,000 unique volunteers. We reached every community. And she did this. She was the manager of this campaign. She and I sat there and we tried to figure out how we're going to do this. And one thing we were going to do was invest early in talking to people. Now, in any other business world, talking to customers does not seem to be a big deal. It's kind of a baseline for being in business. When we told people we were, saving, we were not going to save our money for TV at the end, we were going to invest in voter contact, you'd have thought I had just, my head started spinning. There were screeds written against me by political pundits. People were talking about me. She's going to lose. She's spending 80% of her money talking to voters. How stupid. <laughs> and Lauren and I were like, yeah, uh, yeah we're talking to voters. <laughs> And then it worked. We got 76% of the vote. People were like, that's a good idea, talking to voters. <laughs> and so, so the second, the, that, was, that was the piece of it. And then the third was that I did not pivot. So when I decided to run for office, basically everything I do, I am frustratingly myself. Um, you know, I talked, uh, did a, a conference called Netroots, and I said, look, I'm not going to change my hair, my skin color, my gender to win this election. And there is no amount of Jenny Craig that's going to solve anything in six weeks. So, <laughs> and, and I didn't care. Look, and, and there have been those who made, who made comments. But I was, you know, I could have waited until I solved something that people saw as a disqualifier. Um, I do not have the conventional look for what people think of. And in that space, uh, I also was very clear about how I was going to talk about uh, the person who's here before me uh, talked about living in your values, and that's the only way I know how to be. And so in our campaign, from the very beginning, I said that I was um, unapologetically progressive, and, but, but for me, progress is directly yoked to my values. I believe everyone is entitled to a world-class education. I believe everyone should have access to health care. I believe you shouldn't have to work more than one job to make a living and make a life. These are basic values. And so everything I did flowed from that. And I said it everywhere I went, including into places that had never seen anyone like me, where I wasn't supposed to be successful. I did it in neighborhoods. I talked to the mecha black mechanic and the white farmer and the Latino you know, small business owner and the Korean deli. I did it everywhere. And people were perplexed that I would be that consistent about what I would talk about. And then when the, I won the, the primary, when we got to the general, they thought I would pivot and become more conservative, maybe ameliorate what I said about the fact that I believe in gun safety and gun responsibility, and I know how to shoot. 
I, but I don't think that's a problem. And they were like, well, you should change, you know, you really need to stop talking about some of these things. Now everyone can hear you. I'm like, <laughs> they were here, they could hear me before. <laughs> what you mean is they're paying attention. And, and the reality is in campaigns, you're taught to change who you are to accommodate others, which is the wrong way to think about it. I believe you stand in who you are, but you give people an honest answer so they know whether they want to stand with you. Pretending to be someone you're not means that somebody's gonna be disappointed the first time you make a decision. And so your responsibility is to be entirely authentic from the start. They can decide they don't like you, but at least they know why. So I, I wanna go hear from the audience. Yep. I'm gonna go to you guys in a second, but first, you know, you talked about not looking like a conventional candidate, but you also talked about not having a conventional background. I mean, you, I think your mother call, would call you genteel poor yes. growing up. Um, you know, you're, you've talked very publicly about your personal debt and your brother who was incarcerated and mm -hmm. dealt with a drug problem. Why did you feel like it, you needed to be so transparent about things that were so personal? So uh, in order to afford to run for office, I had to have a job in 2017. And so I wrote a book called Minority Leader. And in the book, I was supposed to give, I wanted to give practical advice for how you, you know, lead from the outside and create real change. And I realized nobody's going to listen to me if I don't tell the truth. Uh, but I also believe in what I call the eight mile uh, political theory. How many of you have seen the movie Eight Mile with Eminem? Okay. So in the last rap battle, <laughs> in Eight Mile, he basically, it tells them, he, he anticipates all of the accusations, all of the screeds against him, and his last line is now, you know, tell them something they don't know about me. In politics, they're gonna find everything. And so what I decided to do was, you know, tell them everything that, that made sense. I talked to my family first and got their permission, but again, you're asking someone to make decisions about your life. They should know how you've lived your life and they should know that you understand the lives they live. I'm deeply private, but I understand that I'm asking people to let me make choices about whether their children will grow up, whether they will have access to opportunity, and for that to be so, they had to believe that I knew where they were. Plus, I was gonna have to file a report <laughs> telling people how broke I was, so there was no point in hiding from it. And, and the reality is I, I, I'm in debt because I've made choices that have helped me be morally fruitful. And if it makes me economically impoverished, and I'm not impoverished, but if it puts me in debt, then that is what it is. But all of us have been in debt and we have to stop being ashamed of it. All of us have family members or friends who've been incarcerated or face drug issues. If we don't talk about it, we can't fix it. And so for me, the authenticity of the moment required a uh, very naked exposition of everything I've ever done wrong, and now I'm done. <laughs> so anybody have a question on that note? We've got a question up front. If you could wait for the mic to get to. Oh, sorry. Let's go here first, and then do we have one over here? Oh, right here in the front. Sorry. Mic ring. Excellent mic wrangling. Thank you. And if you could tell us who you are. Hi, my name is Joe Taka. I'm Vice President of Policy, Engagement, and Impact with Linda. Hi, Stacey. Um, so I have uh, a question, two quick questions. So the first is, you ran an incredible campaign, um, and uh, you, uh, but through the course of the campaign, often I can imagine that you're, you could be in a room as large as this, but sometimes it can, it can be lonely. Um, where did you go for that private source? And then my second question is, how can everyone in this room support and help uh, what you just built? Thank you. So the first is I'm the second of six kids, and my brothers and sisters are my, my best friends. Uh, plus, they are sworn, sworn to secrecy um, <laughs> under penalty of death. So <laughs> plus... <laughs> In, in the spirit of Eight Mile, I know everything about them too. Uh, but, but I mean, they, they were often the folks I would call because they really understood and they've known me so long. And a, a handful of really close friends. I also had friends who were in the same process. Um, ben Jealous, Andrew Gillum, Chris, uh, Gretchen Whitmer were all running and being able to talk to them about the experiences was really meaningful. Fair Fight is our new endeavor. It's, the non, it's a C4 and a political pack and the mission is 
to fight for electoral reform. If you want to learn more, go to Fair Fight Georgia, and we'll tell you all about it. Uh, I encourage you all to get involved, even if, it's not, if you're not in Georgia, because what we do in Georgia will matter for the rest of the country. The narrowing of the electorate may begin with a certain community, but it affects everyone. A Republican just had to have a do-over election because his maps were wrong. And so it's, this isn't a partisan issue. It is a people issue. It is a democracy issue. And if we don't address it, we're going to all be really unhappy one day. So, yes. Um, so I want to end by asking you what everyone in the room probably wants to know. Will you run again? And for what? Yes, I'm going to run again. Um, thank you. If you can all move to Georgia, that would be great. <laughs> now, look, I, I, I care about policy. I am driven by a commitment to justice, to ending poverty, to addressing social needs, and using public policy as a tool to improve the lives of those around us. I have discovered, having been in every sector, having been in the nonprofit sector, the for-profit sector, the, the, biz, the political sector, running for office is the best way to get this done. For me, I'm pretty good at it. And being in office is an effective way to get better done. Uh, what it is I'm gonna run for, I haven't quite decided because I try not to make decisions out of anger too often. Uh, and I wanna make sure that what I run for next is the right job, not just because it has a good title, but because the mission matches my skills and matches the moment. And so, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stacey, thank you so much. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you.